study topic today. Um, very crucial, very important. Um, most of us make the assumption uh, in this area um, that we know, and uh, some of us may not. Uh, we've been talking about the kingdom lately and the importance of the kingdom, the importance of seeking and understanding and walking out the great commission that Yahshua HaMashiach gave to us. And um, there's one element here that we make assumptions with, and it's, a good, it's good to make an assumption in this area particularly, um, but it's better to know why. Um, we know the kingdom mandate, I mean, everything in the, in the New Testament, just so much backs up and mirrors and complements and builds upon the teachings found in what's so in the so-called Old Testament. And, uh, but the amazing thing about the whole thing is that most people who believe that Yahshua is the Messiah today, most people who believe it, really don't even know why. Why he's the Messiah. Why he is the one sent by Yahweh. I mean, they see the, to some degree, maybe the Old Testament fulfillment of the prophets and so on. But if while trying to proclaim the kingdom of Yahweh unto all the nations, if they were to come across a Jewish person and that Jewish person asked them to show them from his Bible, from the Old Testament scriptures, the Tanakh they would call it, asked a Jewish person asked the average traditional Christian or maybe even Messianic today, show me from my Bible, which is Tanakh, that he's really the Messiah. And why? The vast majority of traditional Christians and those who embrace Torah probably would have great difficulty. And that is a problem. That is a major problem. Uh, see, in our, in our society that we live in, we live in a society where Christianity is very prevalent and we just grow up assuming that he really is the Messiah and we have this cultural thing built in where, we, yeah, of course, you know, she was Messiah. Of course he is. And we've been raised in a culture that makes that assumption. But there are some in our culture who have been raised to make the opposite belief. They will assume just the opposite, that he's not the Messiah. And those who are raised in that culture are, based on what I understand from all scripture, that they are under a very strong deception. And it's not a minor deception. It's not some easy thing. This is something that the enemy has used to blind an entire culture and nation of people and has been successful in blinding the descendants of Abraham for nearly 2,000 years. So it's going to be a very subtle, very strong deception. And we have to be aware of this Deception. We have to make sure that we are building our foundation upon the living words of Yahweh. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time, there are some people 
who embrace Messiah and receive him and accept him and also begin to see the blessing of Torah observance and the danger of traditional Christianity theology. And so they begin to look to the rabbis, so to speak. They start looking at the rabbis. And even some Messianic teachers encourage, look at the sages, what the sages have to say. And sadly, they get to look in too much at what the sages have to say and too little at what the scriptures have to say. And so they begin to be under this deception. They begin to question things regarding New Testament scripture. But how many of us right now, whoever is listening to this study today, how many of you, if given the opportunity, could walk up to an unbelieving Jew and open his scriptures, English translation, Tanakh, how many of you could open the Old Testament scripture and say, this is why he's a Messiah? Now, they do have one translation that has skewed things. Um, whenever, you know, even the most basic Hebrew word where it might say tzedek or tzedekah, meaning righteousness, they'll put underneath there, the meaning of this Hebrew word is uncertain. There's nothing uncertain about the meaning of that word. But it happens to be one of the scriptures that we could use to demonstrate he's Messiah. But if you can go back into an older JPS, Tanakh, um, it would become, become a lot easier. Um, but the newer one, we have a bit of a problem because they've changed things around. So, but if you go to, go to one of their older Tanakhs, but how many of you could show them from an accurate translation of Tanakh or Old Testament scripture and show them he's Messiah. We need to know how to do that. You know, Paul the Apostle, uh, <laughs> heard someone say, you know, Paul the Apostle, he didn't just walk into the synagogues and say, yeah, he's Messiah. In fact, I can prove it. See, I wrote this in the letter to the Romans last week, you know. Um, just because he said it doesn't make it true. He had to show them. And he did. He did show them. Many times he showed them. In Acts chapter 18, verse 27, it says, And when he desired to cross to Achaia, his br the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Talking about Paul here. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Yahshua is the Messiah. He showed them from the scriptures. What scriptures? Not 1 Corinthians. <laughs> from the Torah, from the Tanakh. Again, as soon as he became converted, Acts chapter 9, Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Yahshua is the Messiah. This is what he did. This is part of kingdom teaching. Kingdom preaching was proving to the Jews he's the Messiah. Acts 28, 23. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him in his lodging to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the the kingdom of Elohim. Here we go. We can't talk about kingdom unless we also talk about persuading the Jewish people concerning Yahshua from both the law of Moshe and the prophets from morning until evening. This is what he did. This is how it ends. Acts, eight, Acts Book of Acts ends this way. 
with this being Paul's thing that he was doing. They would come to him there and he would explain to them from the law of Moshe and from the prophets that he is Mashiach. So how about us? How grounded are we in Torah in proving he's Messiah? If we can't prove he's Messiah, how can we ever even begin to witness to the descendants of Abraham? It says in the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, because they rejected Messiah, the Gentiles came in, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? You know, I really can't blame the Jewish people too much. I can't blame them too much. Because the sad thing is, the Messiah that has been presented to them, the Messiah that they have been told about, this one that they that is claimed to be in the New Testament Scriptures, this Messiah is a, in, in, through the lenses of traditional Christianity, has been a Messiah who embraced pagan observances that have their roots in idolatry, such as Christmas and Easter, that changed or obliterated the Sabbath, that advocates eating pork, that does away with the holy festivals, and that carries a Latinized, Greekized name. And abolished the Torah. So if they were to reject a Messiah that had those characteristics, you can't blame them too much, because that's not really what Messiah was supposed to do. Nowhere in the prophets does it say, and he will abolish the law. The Torah he will abolish. It never says that. And so Christians, you know, they, they, they go to Israel and they, they step off the bus and, uh, and they look at the Jewish people and they spend a little time with them, you know, and, and uh, they're like, you know, anything I'm doing making you jealous, you know? <laughs> no! No! They're not going to say, I'm jealous. But if we as believers in Yahshua, who have come to understand, he never told anyone break Shabbat. He never advocated the embracing of pagan rooted festivals. Who, And there's nothing in the New Testament that says he abolished the law. And we start keeping festivals. And they're like, what are those Christians over there doing building sukkahs and what, what is that? <laughs> you know, when they start looking at us and we're keeping Torah, in fact, we're in some ways being more faithful to the text of what Torah actually says than what their rabbis have taught them. That's going to provoke them to jealousy and cause them to say, what, you know, some of them get upset. Well, how dare you take our festivals? <laughs> but Messiah himself observed them, and so did the, the apostles and the, and the disciples in the first century. But you know something, listen. If you're like me, and you believe that Yahshua is Messiah, and you also embrace the Torah as being legitimate, and something we should observe today, the law of Yahweh, the, not the Talmud. The Talmud is the Jewish uh, additions to, you know, it's it's a 
rabbinical teaching. I'm talking about the law of Yahweh, the festivals, the Sabbath, the kosher, the cleaning, the, these things. And we start using a Hebrew name for the Messiah. Um, listen, we are, we are the lone witnesses of what Messiah was really like and what he taught. We are the lone witnesses. And so we need to know this topic very well because we are not the lone rangers, the lone witnesses, the lone witnesses for Messiah that will say he embraced Torah. His followers embraced Torah. They weren't None of us can be saved by by keeping Torah because none of us have kept Torah. We can only be saved because of his mercy. And the one through whom we receive that mercy is through the Messiah. And we can show you that in the prophets. We can show you that. And the festivals demonstrate that. And so our study topic today Proving Yahshua is Messiah from the Old Testament, the Tanakh. Uh, they refer to the Old Testament as Tanakh. Um, most Christians call it Old Testament. But we need to know why. We need, when, we, when we come in contact with them, they're going to want to know, okay, what's this all about? Why are you keeping Torah? What's this? Um, a few years ago, I went down to Miami Beach, Florida, and, and we entered a uh, reading room for the Jews, the Jewish people, to go in and read all the different uh, writings of rabbis and uh, and all these things in the Torah, and um, the man who was head of, head of that, uh, we explained to him we observe Torah, but we also believe in Messiah. We call him Yahshua, his Hebrew name. Um, most people call him Jesus, but we call him by his actual given name, heavenly given name, and, uh, and uh, we also observe festivals and, and we keep the clean and unclean, and, and, um, and he says, I said, you ever heard of that before? He says, no, never heard of that. <laughs> when I went to Israel a few years ago, back in 2009, um, I am walking around with my tassels on and no keep on my head, which is tradition, but got the tassels. And everywhere I went, they wanted to know what I believed. The security checkpoints, we would always get the question. We started calling security checkpoints witnessing points because they wanted to know. <laughs> and, uh, and most of them had never heard of that. We went, we went to En Gedi, this massive waterfall, the En Gedi. And, uh, and back down, we sat down to eat lunch. And, a, and a, a fellow come over to us, and he, he was from the Canada, Canada. He says, can you guys tell me what you believe? All the, the Jewish school children want to know because they were there on a field trip. <laughs> and so we had an opportunity to share that we observe Torah and we keep the uh, festivals and we also embrace Messiah. He goes, I've never heard of that before. See, they live in these little closed communities and very you people and they don't even really pay attention to what's going on in the outside world. They're in their own zone. They're in their own community. And so they don't really relate too much with the Gentiles, some of them. Particularly the ones that are living together in the same area, neighborhoods and so on. And so there were some of them I talked to who even said I knew the Torah better than they did doesn't make me better than them or, or I'm not trying to be arrogant toward them um, but that caused them to think this may this this whatever you got there is obviously real and in fact they asked me if I was Jewish I said I don't know for sure possibly and um, and I told them I believed in the Messiah but I also observed Torah and they were like oh you're Jewish then you're Jew if you keep Torah in their minds 
he might as well be Jewish, even if you believe in Messiah. And there are Orthodox rabbis and, and people who live over there who actually still keep Torah. They also believe in Messiah, but they're not rejected by the community because they're still holding on to the identity as being Jewish, Torah observance. But we, we as believers in Messiah, we've got to have a sure foundation. And the only sure foundation is this. 1 Corinthians 3.11 For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Yahshua the Messiah. He is our foundation. The Anointed One. Yahshua Anointed. He is Yahweh's Anointed. A lot of people say, well, he's our Messiah. No, he's not. He's not our, he's Yahweh's Messiah. Yahweh is the one who anointed him. Yahweh is the anointer, not us. So he is Yahweh's anointed, which came to us. Not one scripture anywhere refers to Yahshua as our Messiah. It is Yahweh's Messiah, because we did not anoint him. It's Yahweh's anointed. So, he is the anointed one, the one who was anointed by Yahweh. And we are placing Yahshua the Messiah as the foundation, the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of Elohim, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yahshua Messiah himself being a chief cornerstone. You notice that it doesn't say we're built on the foundation of the law and prophets, but the apostles and prophets. That's interesting. In whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in Yahweh, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of Elohim in the Spirit. And so, why the apostles and prophets? See, Yahshua is our foundation, right? And it's through the apostles' ministry that we heard about Messiah. He is the living law, the living Torah, and he is the one through whom we receive salvation. And so he is the foundation. But we can't hear about him unless we've had the witnesses, the apostles. And we never hear about him unless we had the witnesses, the prophets, which are a witness to him. And so we have to understand why he's our foundation. As we begin to understand and examine the scriptures which speak of Messiah in the so-called Old Testament, um, we need to understand what scriptures speak of him and how and why and where. And be able to uh, adequately defend not only to Jewish people but toward people who may have been from us at one time and among us at one time but have embraced rabbinical lines of thinking and have come and believe it or not there are people who walk into this faith who after having received Messiah and Torah begin to reject Messiah and reject Paul, the apostle. You throw out Paul, then you gotta throw out Luke, who was Paul's traveling companion in the book of Acts. And if you throw out Luke and Paul, you also have to throw out Peter as well, because he said Paul's writings were scripture. And so all you have left is a bare bones New Testament. And once you get that ball rolling, begin to also question Messiah himself to your own destruction. And I've known people who have gone that way, anti-missionary Jewish people uh, who have persuaded people of our faith that Yahshua was not Messiah. And because those people did not have a sure foundation as to why he's Messiah, 
they walked away. See, those of us raised in traditional Christianity, we just don't know the Old Testament that well. And so these Jews come along, oh, we've been studying the Old Testament for 3,000 years. We've been studying these words. We know the Hebrew, and we know this, and, and people tend to trust them. Okay, well, I have, can't argue with that. Yeah, they've been studying it longer than I have. What am I, two years? Three years? And they've been doing this for 3,000 years? Listen, it's not how many years you, you have read scripture. Even a, even a baby can understand. Listen, it's with what heart you read. It's with what attitude you read when you read. There are, there are people in Christian seminaries and professors who have went over the Bible a thousand times and missed the blessing of Torah and missed important. Why? Because they're looking at the scriptures through their seminary brainwashed glasses, traditional Christianity glasses, and they can't see beyond that. And the same is true those who are in traditional Judaism. Okay, they studied it for 3,000 years. But from what, what understanding, with what attitude, with what approach? That's the key difference. Yes, they can teach us a few things. I'm not saying they, that we can learn nothing from them. But there's a danger. The people in the first century, the 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 people who were who were Jewish people in the first century, you know what Yahshua told them. In John five forty five, he says, "Do not even think. Do not think I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you. Moshe, Moses, in whom you trust." The one they were trusting in became their accusers. Why? He said, For if you believed Moshe, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you did not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Moshe, the one they were trusting in, the one that they were studying and studying and studying, He's talking to the Jews in, in the area, in Judea. He says, the one you study is the one who accuses you. Interesting statements. And so, they did not know Torah. Because they did not know Messiah. If they would have known the Torah, they would have known Messiah. And so in all these rabbinical understandings, the stone edition Tanakh, and all these other things, they miss a lot. In fact, mainstream Judaism, who the rabbis and so on, what are they really following? They're following the Talmud, Talmud, which contains the Mishnah, and the Mishnah itself contains these writings from first century Jews, these principles from first century Jews, the very people who rejected Messiah. And so mainstream Judaism today, in many ways, especially the Orthodox, have the same blinders on that Yahshua spoke of in the first century. And yet we have people in the messianic, so-called messianic faith today, patterning themselves after this rabbi stuff. And, I mean, which of the apostles called themselves rabbi? Name one. <laughs> zero. None. Nada. Zilch. Zero. Not, none of them did. Why? Doesn't that tell you something? And so why would we call our, the teachers in our faith rabbi? There's only one reason. You're trying to 
follow your, your, your pattern after Ju mainstream Judaism. That's not the pattern that we want to follow. First century believers were very successful in bringing some Jews. There were tens of thousands who believed in Messiah. Paul was one of them. And uh, they were able to demonstrate from the, the prophets he was Messiah. Now, if you ever come across someone who does reject Messiah, um, as a result of their you know, studies, they used to be believers like us, but at some point they began to reject Paul, and then the virgin birth, and then the Messiah himself. If you ever come across someone who has that in their background, you're wasting your time trying to convert them back. I've, at least as far as I've ever seen. They reach the point of no return. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have partasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of Elohim and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the son of Elohim and put him to an open shame. They used to believe in Messiah and they even embraced Torah. But they tasted the heavenly gift. They were partakers of the Holy Spirit. They tasted the good word of Elohim. And they walked away from Messiah. Blasphemous. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They will blaspheme Messiah. You'll hear it. What they'll say. And I'm so I'm sounding the alarm ahead of time. Don't walk down this road. Do not walk down this road. Thoroughly, thoroughly study why he's Messiah. Don't fall headlong into Judaism that is without Messiah. You know, every false doctrine has one thing in common. They reject a part of Scripture. In the case of Christianity, they throw the Old Testament aside. It's, you know, quaint, cute, but they're going to follow New Testament, even if a new... And so they're not going to follow Old Testament. Judaism says, we're going to receive this, the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, the writings, the Old Testament. New Testament, we don't do. And so, and so people throw out the word. The one common denominator. All false doctrine has one thing in common. They set aside, they minimize, they reject some scripture somewhere. That's the common denominator. And so those who go the anti-Paul route, they start rejecting one part, and it's a slippery slope as they go sliding down the hill. Some don't go all the way. I've seen a lot go. And so, we need to receive the fullness of his word. All of it. Yahweh is not divided. Those, those who knew and established, the apostles established that Yahshua was Messiah. They taught the truth. And the truth they taught was from the Tanakh, from the prophets, from the writings. But when we start rejecting scripture and throwing scriptures out, we start molding our own Elohim. Start forming him into our image rather than letting him define himself. We need to let Yahweh define himself. You need to let him tell us who he is and not us decide who he is. And so those who have gone that route and have rejected Messiah, I've not seen one ever, not one, in 23 years of this walk. 
of keeping Torah, believing Messiah, not one person I've ever seen come back. It's impossible. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from Elohim, but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. And we're given a warning here in Second John chapter 1, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Yahshua, Messiah, is coming in the flesh. They don't believe he's Messiah. This is a deceiver. He's a deceiver, and he's an anti-Messiah. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that may re we may receive a full reward. You walk away from him, you lose it. And he goes on to say, Whoever transgresses and does not abide, that means at one time they were in it, but they left. They don't abide in the doctrine of Messiah. That's the doctrine that he is Messiah. Does not have Elohim. He who abides in the doctrine of Messiah has both Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. Don't even greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Don't even say hello, shalom, anything. He's dead while he lives. This is what we need to do as believers in Yahshua. You come across someone who used to believe in Messiah, but rejected him, did not abide in the doctrine of Messiah. He's become an anti-Messiah, doesn't believe he is Messiah anymore. You're sharing in his evil deeds just by even greeting him, let alone inviting him in your house. Now, I didn't say it. I'm just reading what the scriptures say. Serious words. We don't want to share in their evil deeds. And so while it may be discouraging to see, yes, there are some people who they were on a narrow way and they rejected Messiah, we shouldn't be surprised because it happens. It does happen. First of all, when you come together as a congregation, I hear that there are divisions among you. In part, I believe it, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Yes, there's divisions, and we need to make sure that those divisions, they move away. They go wherever they're going to go, and we have nothing to do with them. In fact, 1 John 2.18 says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you've heard, the anti-Messiah is coming. Even now, many anti-Messiahs have come, by which we know it is the last hour. They went out from us. Yahweh knew they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But as they went out, but they went out that they might be manifest, that none of them were of us. Yahweh knows them that are his. Some are, some aren't. Basically the same thing Paul said. Now, if you've never come across these kinds of, of people, um, Maybe what I'm saying to you just sounds very strange to your ears. But I'm warning you ahead of time. They're out there. And I don't want any I don't want to be around them. I don't want anything to do with them. And so let's dig into the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and see what we can find. Let's start examining prophecies. You know, a lot of people want to know what's what's meant in Revelation. You know, what what's how's everything going to pan out? If you really want to know prophecy, you got to first understand how prophecy was fulfilled in the past. You got to understand why he's Messiah. 
If you don't understand how prophecy was fulfilled in the past, then you're going to be confused and not really understand how it's fulfilled in the future. And many people who study prophecy, they don't know the difference. But um, I mean, even even the disciples didn't fully understand what was going on, you know, until after Messiah died, and then they began to see fulfilled prophecy, and then they were able to understand the future and how it fits. So we need to make sure that we understand why he's Messiah. If you don't understand why he's Messiah from the Old Testament, you may not ever understand prophecy to begin with. Because that's a foundation. And no other foundation can anyone lay but that. And so, we're going to start with, with reading here, uh, Isaiah 52, 13, and through Isaiah 53. Um, I once heard a story of a Christian who had read this, Isaiah 52, 13, to the end of Isaiah 53, and he was reading this, and he was talking to his Jewish friend, his, and his Jewish friend says, um, the Christian said to his Jewish friend, can I just read you something? And the, the Jewish friend said, I don't know. You know, he's trying to convince him he was Messiah. He said, I just want to read you this. And he read to him Isaiah 52, 13, through um, the end of 53, and when he read this to the Jewish man, the Jewish man said, listen, I told you, I don't believe in that New Testament. Actually, he was reading from Isaiah. And the Jewish man thought he was reading from the New Testament because it so clearly pictures what Messiah did for us. And, uh, and so we want to start there. Um, starting Isaiah 52, 13. And if you want to get your Bible and follow along here, I would encourage it. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. My servant. Who, will be, who is this servant? Who would be the identity of this servant? What is his identity? We're going to find out. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high, just as many as were, just as many were astonished at you. So his visage was was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for what had not been told them, they shall see. And they, and what they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? Not everyone's going to believe this. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. as the branch. And as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't a beautiful man, according to this, contrary to the paintings we might see. He, has, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by Elohim, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a beautiful scripture. He was oppressed and was and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, 
and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul, his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. For by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Who is this person? A very detailed script description of one who was called Yahweh's servant. Now we know, that those of us who know Messiah will, will read this and can become very moved by it. But here in these 15 verses, there are at least 58 characteristics of this servant. He is described in extreme detail. And uh, if this servant of Isaiah chapter 53 is the Messiah, then what we have here is a very, very clear picture of what this Messiah is supposed to do. And it's all predicted to take place ahead of time. Um, now maybe, some, some would say, some may say, maybe, that this is talking about the Jewish people. They're the ones that suffered all these years. Well, hold that thought for a moment because we don't have to go back and forth with them on this. There are a lot of studies on that subject, and that seems to be the focus of their interpretation of that. But, you know, I don't have to just look into this verse alone. I don't have to just look at Isaiah 53 and say, see, this is a Messiah. I can go into other scriptures which speak of a suffering servant as well, which clearly are Messianic scriptures. And so we're going to examine a few of these, and there are some um, that the Jewish people would recognize are clearly Messianic um, in nature. That would be scriptures that they would regard to be talking of Messiah. But first, let's look at Isaiah chapter 42. In Isaiah 42, verse 1, it says, Behold my servant. Here we go. Another description of my servant. In whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. That's what he's going to do. Whoever the servant is. And we'll be neutral. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait for this servant's law. This is law. Thus says Elohim Yahweh, who created the heavens and, and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth in that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people in on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. I, Yahweh, have called you, that's the servant, in righteousness and will hold your hand I will keep you and give you 
he will give I will give you you as a covenant this servant will be a covenant to who the people the people of Israel as a light to the Gentiles as a light to the Gentiles so one of the things the Messiah is going to do is be a light the servant I should say I'm sorry it's going to be a light to the Gentiles. That's one of the things the servant's going to be. Okay. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 11. Now, to the best of my understanding, all Jewish people ex accept and receive Isaiah chapter 11 as being a scripture in their in the prophets that clearly references the Messiah they all agree to my knowledge 100% agreement okay and here we go it says there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots remember Isaiah 52 the branch little bud that came up the spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yahweh. His delight is in the fear of Yahweh. That's what he delights in. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And coastlands shall wait for his law. Didn't what we read earlier? Isaiah 42 4. What does it say here? He will decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall judge the poor. He'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And what do we read in Isaiah 42? The Messiah would do. The servant would do. Should I should say. The servant would not fail nor be discouraged till he established justice in the earth. Do we see a connection between Isaiah chapter 11 and Isaiah chapter 42? That they are both talking about the same person? And yet Isaiah 42 verse 1 refers to this person as a servant, his servant. Would that not connect, at least produce the possibility that the servant in Isaiah 53 and 52 would also be Messiah? We connect the three together. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 53. Here he is predicted to produce and to give us justice in the earth. Continuing here. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Now you see here he's called, he, he has, he's got righteousness on him. And what did Yahweh say about this servant in Isaiah 42. I, Yahweh, have called you in righteousness. We called him to do. And will hold your hand. I will give, I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to who? The Gentiles. It's going to be a light to the Gentiles. And he's also going to be a covenant. Continue reading um, Isaiah 11. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, 
the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Clearly futuristic messianic prophecy. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh, as waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Here we are, talking about this messianic figure once again, the root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him. He's going to be this banner to the Gentiles. And his resting place shall be glorious. So we see another parallel here, where we read earlier in Isaiah chapter 42, that this servant of Isaiah 42 would be a light to the Gentiles. And so we can at least see, see based on Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1 that the one who is called my servant is clearly connected. This one called my servant, Isaiah 42, is clearly connected to a clear messianic prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11, fulfilling the same promises that Isaiah 11 speaks of. And so we can make a connection there. Now, we can confirm this even more. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 1. Thus says Yahweh, Where is the certificate of your mother's divorce, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? For your iniquities you have sold yourselves, and for your transgressions your mother has been put away. He's talking about how they sold themselves into sin. And he goes on to say, Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Indeed, with my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink because there is no water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness. I make sackcloth their covering. Who is this fellow? Is this Yahweh? Their master Yahweh has given me the tongue of the learned. Now oh, wait a minute. This person who, whoever it is, closed the heavens with blackness, can dry up the sea, has the power to deliver and to redeem. He came, he says. He says he came and there was no one. No one to answer. And he goes on to say, The Master Yahweh has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning and awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Master Yahweh has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Interesting. He was not rebellious. Yahweh gave him the tongue of the learned. And yet he also had power to dry the sea, power to redeem, power to clothe the heavens with blackness. This is matching up well with Isaiah 11. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, faithfulness the belt of his waist. The messianic figure of Isaiah 11. Let's continue reading. He goes on to say, I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and from spitting. For the Master Yahweh, the one who gave him the tongue of the learned, the one that established righteousness in him, the Master Yahweh will help me. Therefore I will not be disgraced. 
Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Who is this man of Isaiah 50? Who is he? He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Master Yahweh will help me. Who is he who will, who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. And the kidding, he won't grow old like a garment. Who among you fears Yahweh? Who obeys the voice of what? His servant. Once again, a connection not only between a messianic-like figure of Isaiah 11 and a servant, but a servant who suffers. And, as it says, struck him. They plucked out the beard. They spit on him. This is what they did with this servant. He says they're going to grow old. But who obeys the voice of his servant? Do we see a connection between a servant and Isaiah 42? Who is clearly connected to the Messiah in Isaiah 40.11. There's multiple characteristics where they match together doing the same function. And then we see a servant in Isaiah chapter 50 who has tremendous amount of supernatural power. And this servant Isaiah chapter, chapter 50 was one who was wounded. He was wounded. And then he says, Who among you fears Yahweh, who obeys the voice of his servant, who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of Yahweh and rely upon his Elohim. Look, all you who kindle the fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and the sparks you kindled. This you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Whoa. Whoever this servant is in Isaiah chapter 50 will have the power to torment, even though he was struck, even though he was had his beard pulled out. Yahweh gave him the tongue of the learned. You don't want to contend with whoever this is. And so we see a suffering servant who will who will take vengeance on his adversaries. He will destroy the wicked with the breath of his lips, according to Isaiah 11. Do we see a connection between Isaiah 11, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 50? And hopefully you see, because Isaiah 50 speaks of a servant who suffers, and yet will come back and will take judgment to the earth, that we can see a connection between that and Isaiah chapter 53, a suffering servant. In Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to take a, take a complete inventory and look at a complete picture of why this servant would have to even suffer to begin with. For what reason? Would the Messiah, the servant, for what reason would would Yahweh allow him to go through suffering, the servant? Why? Is Yahweh unjust that he would cause his servants to suffer? Why are they? Why is he suffering? Isaiah fifty-three verse ten. It says it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He was glad to do it. He has put him to grief. When you make 
his soul an offering for sin. A sin offering. It says, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. Uh, now the Dead Sea Scrolls here actually have that he will see the light of life. In other words, he will, it has to do with the resurrection, he will see light. And um, we'll get into the seed here in a minute. But notice the reason why Yahweh bruised this servant was because this servant's soul was going to be a sin offering. The Hebrew word is a sham, a sin offering, a guilt offering. And we see an example of where a, a sham is used in, a, in Leviticus 19. It says, whoever lies carnally with a woman who is betrothed to a man as a, to a, man as a concubine, and who has not at all been redeemed nor given her freedom, for this shall, there shall be scourging, but they shall not be put to death because she was not free. And he shall bring his asham, the trespass offering, guilt offering, to Yahweh, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, to a ram as a trespass offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him. Atonement with the ram of the trespass offering. Same Hebrew word, asham, before Yahweh for his sin which he's committed, and his sin which he has committed shall be forgiven him. So this servant's nefesh, his soul, was asham. It was, according to Isaiah 53, a trespass offering. An offering for sin. Now we all know that no, no way do we see anywhere in the Torah where Yahweh says, offer up a human as a sacrifice. He never says that. And so why would he say later in Isaiah chapter 53, in fact he says not to, why would he say later in Isaiah 53 that this servant's soul would be a trespass offering? And one, as it says here, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many and shall bear their iniquities. How can a man bear the iniquities of others? How can a man create justification this word has to do with righteousness. Cause others to be righteous by his offering. Now it's a spiritual offering. No one took Messiah and laid him on an altar and cooked him. He willingly laid down himself, if you read in the New Testament, the record of Messiah. So he had to be someone who offered himself willingly. No one's allowed to take another human being and offer them as a sacrifice. But we see here, it's obviously there. <laughs> Someone's soul is an offering for sin. Someone who has Yahweh's righteousness in him. Someone who had the tongue of the learned. Someone who was righteous. No human being could even be a, a, an offering without blemish unless they were completely perfect. And that's one reason why no one would be accepted before Yahweh as a offering. But Messiah gave of himself willingly. And so we see here, Yahweh saw the labor of his soul. Whoever this is, is bringing justification and bearing iniquities. For other people. For who? Who, are, who is there? If Isaiah 53 is talking about Israel, then who is there? It, there is all of us. 
It's, and so he is distinguished as being different from Israel. And so Isaiah 53 can't be talking about Israel. And so are there any examples somewhere else in Scripture where this concept, Isaiah 53, about the Messiah bearing the sins of others and bringing justification to others, causing others to be declared righteous, is this concept found anywhere else in Messianic prophecy? I mean, if Isaiah 53 is talking about the Messiah, wouldn't there be other scriptures that indicate the Messiah is going to bring righteousness to others? Well, there is. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of Yahweh, and their righteousness is from me, says Yahweh. The, the servants of Yahweh, they get this blessing. They get to have righteousness that comes from Yahweh the Father. It says that our righteousness, in other words, we can't establish our own righteousness. We need to have Yahweh's righteousness in us in order for him to accept us. And in fact, this is our heritage. This is something we inherit, is Yahweh's righteousness. We read earlier, somebody took our sins and laid them upon the Messiah, who bore them for us. And he, by that, he became the offering for sin, through which we receive atonement. And so... We look here and we say, okay, Yahweh placed his righteousness on Messiah. Yahweh placed the tongue of the learned on Messiah. And therefore, Messiah became the atonement, the sin offering, through which we could receive righteousness. That would all line up perfectly. So are there any other scriptures that would indicate we get our righteousness from Messiah? Yes. Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh. I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called Yahweh our righteousness. The Messiah is actually called Yahweh Tzidkenu, Yahweh our righteousness. Remember what Yahweh said? This is the heritage of his servants, the servants of Yahweh, that our righteousness will come from him. And here's the Messiah, clearly one raised to David. And what's he called? He's called Yahweh, Yahweh our righteousness. It's amazing. This is very consistent with other scriptures we've examined, proving that Yahshua would be a righteous servant that would justify many. This Messiah, I won't name him yet. I'm sorry, I said Yahshua, didn't I? He, a Messiah would justify many. He would be a righteous servant to justify many. And he would become a trespass offering that would bring forgiveness of sin. You know, yeah, sure, he even told this briefly when I examine what one thing he said here. Yahshua said, why do you call me good? There's one that's good. Talking about the Father. So whatever righteousness he had came from the Father. And so here we are, Yahweh, our righteousness. We are, through him, we are, we are declaring Yahweh gives us righteousness through him. And to me, that's awesome. All right. Let's look at some other passages here. 
Isaiah 45, 23. It says, I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, what? In Yahweh I have righteousness and strength. In other words, only in Yahweh do I have righteousness. To him men shall come and shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In Yahweh all the descendants of Israel shall be what? Justified. That word is the same word as righteousness up here. Same exact Hebrew word. Only this is one who is being made righteous. In Yahweh, all the sons of Israel shall be declared righteous and shall glory. Only through Yahweh. So once again, we see it's only through Yahweh, the Father, that we can be declared righteous. And every knee will bow and every tongue will, will declare an oath saying that is true. Only through Yahweh do I become righteous. That's a confession. And all the descendants of Israel is going to confess it one day. Only in Yahweh shall the sins of Israel be justified. And what does it say in Isaiah 53, 11? He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge, my righteous servant. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. Yahweh gave him the tongue of the learned. Isaiah 50 gave him the tongue of the learned. For he shall bear their iniquities. He doesn't have to bear his own iniquities. He doesn't have any iniquities. He has to bear the iniquities of others. You can't bear another's iniquities when you got your own. But through this servant of Isaiah 53, many people are going to be justified. In fact, every knee will bow, every tongue will take an oath, saying only in Yahweh are we justified. And it was Yahweh's righteousness placed on this servant, Isaiah 53, that enabled justification to take place. Isaiah 59. Look at some others here. Isaiah 59 verse 15 says, So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. You try to walk in righteousness, and you become a prey. Then Yahweh saw it. See, because you become a prey when you walk in righteousness, People don't want to walk in righteousness. Then Yahweh saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. His own righteousness, it sustained him. Very interesting. It should sound kind of familiar because... Remember we read earlier about in Isaiah 53. First verse out of Isaiah 53 is, To whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? And so here we have Yahweh's own arm bringing salvation, his own righteousness. It sustained him. It pleased Yahweh to grieve him and to make his soul an offering for sin. The one who is called Yahweh our righteousness. This Messiah of, I, of Jeremiah 23 verses 5 and 6. Do we see how all these verses are kind of interwoven and just gel together to produce a picture of what the Messiah was supposed to do? And I'm not finished yet. Yahweh's own arm is going to bring the salvation that we need. 
Yahweh's own arm will be the intercessor. To whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed then? That will bring us righteousness. To sustain Yahweh and to please Him. Isaiah 40 verse 10. It says, The Master Yahweh shall come with a strong hand, and His arm shall rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and His work before Him. So this arm, to whom the arm of Yahweh has been revealed, this arm here, <laughs> is going to bring righteousness to sustain Yahweh, and this arm is also going to do something else. It's going to rule. How about that? Isn't that what Messiah is supposed to do, to do, is to rule? To become a king? You know, just connect Isaiah 40 verse 10 to Isaiah 53 11, and if you don't see a connection, I mean, you're missing something. It connects the ruling king with the suffering servant as being the same person. Just those two verses alone would connect that. But his arm is going to be the ruler, and we know Messiah, Isaiah 11, is going to be the ruler of the earth. Even Jews agree, Isaiah 11, that Messiah is going to be a king and a ruler. But to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? Here's a righteous servant justifying many and bearing many iniquities. Not everybody has had this revealed to them who the arm of Yahweh truly is. But the arm of Yahweh is the Messiah, the suffering servant, the one who became the righteousness of Yahweh, the real servant of Yahweh that we see in the book of Isaiah is starting to shape up and take and we can see who he is and we haven't even opened a New Testament scripture to speak of but we see the Messiah would be defined as one who suffers one who rules one who is the arm of Yahweh one who bears the sin of many and, and justifies many who brings righteousness to the people who's called Yahweh our righteousness this all connects together without even looking at New Testament, we can see a picture emerging of what the Messiah was going to be like. And to me, that's the most important thing to communicate. Okay, you don't believe Yahshua is the Messiah. Let's look at some scripture and see what the scriptures say the Messiah would do. What he's going to be like. And through that, a picture will emerge that is undeniably the one spoken of in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and so on. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, the Master Yahweh shall come with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. It's called a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Sounds like a good shepherd. Sounds like a really good shepherd. Isaiah 59, 15, So truth fails. Revisit this in the context. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then Yahweh saw it and displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wanted there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him. His own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries. What do you say? You shall have from my hand, you shall lie down in torment. Isaiah 50. Recompense to his enemies, the coastlands he will fully repay. So we see a righteous servant bringing righteousness, bringing salvation, and bringing judgment and recompense to his enemies.
so shall they fear the name of Yahweh from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the standard of the spirit of Yahweh will lift up a standard against him. The Redeemer will come to Zion and say unto those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says Yahweh. That's those who repent. Clearly messianic here, right? As for me, says Yahweh, this is my covenant with them. A covenant is being spoken of now. My spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says Yahweh, from this time and forevermore. So we see here, as a result of this salvation the Messiah brings, there's a covenant. Didn't we read this earlier? Isaiah 42. He says, I will. I have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. So now we see a new thing. This Messiah is going to become and bring a covenant, a new covenant. You know, a lot of these prophecies here are from the book of Isaiah. And um, of all the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in 1948 and, and so it's just subsequent years, almost I think it's the complete book of Isaiah was found. The complete book of Isaiah was found. And this book of Isaiah predates... The Messiah's life by about 200, 150 to 200 years. The scroll actually dates back to 150 to 200 years before Messiah even came. Imagine that. Like from now, go back a couple hundred years, you know, we're talking about 1813. That's how old, you know, um, before Messiah even came. And here is describing. A certain man, in great detail, if you read from the New Testament, incredibly detailed description of what Messiah would do. And this is the claims of the New Testament, that he was righteous, he didn't sin one time. He, was, he suffered and he was killed. He was given the grave with the wicked with the with the righteous although he was killed and that he was a covenant to the people and that he would give he would reign until he puts all of enemies his enemies under his feet now the covenant that we read about here in I in Isaiah 50 uh, 59 a covenants also mentioned in the book of Jeremiah Interestingly, they found in Israel, Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe, they actually found his seal. They found it. And they dated it to the time of Jeremiah the prophet. They actually found Baruch's, Baruch, who was Jeremiah's scribe, they found his seal with which he sealed the scrolls, which we read, if you read Jeremiah, the, the king burned them, and so he, he made them again. But anyway, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Here's that covenant again. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their, on their hearts, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. This is my words shall not depart from your mouth. And so, similar to Isaiah 59, 15. Now, here's another scripture. 
And Isaiah 61, which will agree with everything we've said so far, many Jewish people regard Isaiah 61 as speaking of Messiah. It says, The Spirit of the Master Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good news, good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh, and the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Sion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he may be glorified. See, there's an anointed person bringing good news. Wouldn't be good news if Messiah is telling everyone that he's going to kill them all. It would be good news if he said he's going to bring, he's going to bear their iniquities. Wouldn't that be better news? And he's the righteous one. And what does it, what does it say here? Isaiah 61 he has anointed me. He anointed me. Clearly messianic here. And so Messiah is going to give something to the people that enables them to be called trees of righteousness. And he's going to give them the spirit, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. They may be called trees of righteousness. He's going to give them righteousness. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be named priests of Yahweh. They shall call you the servants of our Elohim. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. In their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, Yahweh, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. There it is, the covenant again. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the posterity whom Yahweh has blessed. I will, I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul shall be joyful in my Elohim, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. There we go. The robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, ornaments as a bride adorns herself with jewels. And so, again, we see Yahweh is going to bring righteousness to his people through this work of the Messiah. Grant them the robe of righteousness. And Yahweh is clothing his people because, because his servant bore their iniquities and justified many, and declared many righteous. And so we see, see again, Isaiah 61, this covenant is predicted. This covenant with his people. Now look at Psalm chapter 98. O oh, sing unto Yahweh a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. Yahweh has made known his salvation through whom we are made righteous. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. We see the connection here between the holy arm bearing the sins of the people to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed. His holy arm ruling for him. His holy arm bringing salvation and bringing fact that righteousness will finally be revealed because this holy Messiah will be righteous and he will be revealed in the sight of who the nations as the Gentiles 
the Gentiles, will have this arm of Yahweh revealed to them. That's a pre prediction here in the psalm. But he's also remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. He hasn't forgotten to reveal to them his holy arm so that all the ends of the earth will have seen the salvation of our Elohim. Shout joyfully to Yahweh all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. Sing to Yahweh with the harp, with the harp and sound of the psalm. Because of the right hand, the holy arm, and what he did in Isaiah 53, his righteousness, his salvation comes to the nations, the Gentiles. It is revealed to them, but he hasn't forgotten Israel, his, the Jewish people. He hasn't forgotten them. He's remembered his mercy toward the house of Israel. And so it's sort of predicted here, even in the Psalms. They'll see it, and then later he'll remember them. He's going to remember his mercy toward them and his faithfulness toward them. And now, through, through provoking the jealousy, through the heathen walking in Torah, they're going to receive him again. They're going to receive him again. Let it be so. With the trumpets and the sound of the horn, shout joyfully before Yahweh the King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands and the hills be joyful together before Yahweh, for he is coming to judge the earth. Even though whenever we see the Messiah, he's going to come and judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the earth and the peoples with equity. Here we go. Here we go again. With righteousness, Isaiah 11, 4, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Do we see it all connecting, brothers and sisters? Let's back up a few verses here. The judgment, the mercy toward the house of Israel, the salvation, the holy arm, his righteousness being revealed. His salvation being revealed. It's all connected. It's all connected. And there are many other scriptures that we could look at. Isaiah 49 clearly connects the servant of Isaiah 49 to regather Israel, to regather them. The servant will regather Israel. And so the servant can't be Israel, the servant's regathering Israel. Um, and so there's many others that we could go over but I won't extend this too much further out I just want us to see a picture a vision and catch an understanding of what this Savior, this Messiah is going to do and once we understand what the Messiah is going to do it becomes very obvious that the New Testament the New Testament makes, just like the Old Testament, it's historically accurate. It's scientifically accurate. I mean, like when Messiah said that the, the grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies. That's what happens. The, it decomposes. And so, Archaeological finds have, have, have confirmed, like talks about Caiaphas, the high priest who commanded that Messiah would be put to death. They found him. They found his bone box. And so that for years people tried to say that there was no Pontius Pilate. But then they found this reference to him in one of the inscriptions. So the events which occurred are historical events provided by eyewitnesses of those historical events. 
When Paul wrote about Messiah, he said there were 400 people who saw the Messiah resurrected. There were many witnesses. Now, you have, when he's writing this letter to them, he's, he's not just making this up. They could have quickly have said, no, it didn't, it didn't happen. He just matter-of-factly saying there were 400 witnesses who saw him resurrected. And that's also predicted. The Messiah would be resurrected. The Messiah is seen in the beautiful imagery of Passover. That just in, just in the Torah, we have the children of Israel crying out for deliverance from, from bondage, even as we cry out for deliverance from sin. And Yahweh revealed to them how strong and powerful he is to the plagues. At some point, Yahweh revealed to us how strong and powerful he is, how superior he is to all the gods of this world. And then he saved them by the blood of the Lamb. And on the exact hour, the children of Israel in the first century were killing Passover lambs. Yahshua died at that exact hour time that ninth hour that's just one example but if you study Matthew to Revelation it will reveal a consistency with everything found in the Tanakh in the Old Testament now if you misunderstand Tanakh you misunderstand the Old Testament prophecies misunderstand the prophets yeah, you'll come across things that don't make sense. But we have to properly understand them. But you know, in a Jewish synagogue today, they never read Isaiah 53. They know better. They pick other parts. In fact, they don't read a whole lot out of the prophets. Focuses on Torah, 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 you know, which is fine. They don't want to go too deeply into the prophets because they know Messiah is written all over the place. They have to answer too many questions. On Eliad.com slash the Messiah dot HTML. Eliad.com forward slash the Messiah dot HTML. Uh, we go over this in depth and we compare all the places where Yahshua HaMashiach is fulfilling prophecy in great detail. Maybe I'll share more next week. But um, you can go there. Uh, but there's innumerable Messianic prophecies. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is just one example. Um, in Psalm 22, it talks about a man says, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them and from my clothing they cast lots that happened now one thing the Messiah was never predicted to do and that is abolish the law nowhere in fact talks about Messiah here it says Yahweh is well pleased for his righteousness sake who's right Messiah's righteousness sake it says he will exalt the law and make it honorable. In fact, the law will be written in our hearts. But as I think we're going to share more next week. I just think we need to. Transgression of the law was not a part of Yahweh's plan for us and not part of Yahweh's plan for the Messiah to bring about either. Restoring people to Torah observance is why he came. Restoring people who had been overrun by sin was part of why he came. Repentance from sin is part of why he came. And I think we'll share again next week. And so, brothers and sisters, know the prophets, and you'll know the Messiah. Know what the Messiah came to do, and it will become crystal clear, no doubt about it, unquestionable. 
Yahushua is HaMashiach. He is the Messiah. We'll explore more, more next week, brothers and sisters. And until then, let's rejoice in the fulfillment of prophecy. And may Yahweh bless you. And may Yahweh have mercy on us all.